These original handmade dioramas of mechs, buildings, and vehicles tell the stories of the world of Aegis, a technologically advanced planet crippled by an invasive fungal infection. Today we're traveling from the forests of Divini to Arami, just north of the dunes of Pulsera. I'll assemble and learn to use a brand new tool for diorama creation, and then we'll conceptualize, build, and paint the 14th installment in this series while diving into its lore. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. A few weeks ago, I received an intriguing email from Sinus, a laser cutter manufacturer. They offered to send me the latest model of their Ortur Laser Master series so that I could see if I could make anything interesting with it. I accepted, and a few weeks later, these boxes arrived. What I received was the Ortur Laser Master 3, along with an enclosure. Since I live in a tiny apartment, the enclosure is a must for venting the smoke produced by the laser. While I was impressed with the sturdy build quality, to say that I was feeling overwhelmed at this point by the sheer number of components in these boxes would be an understatement. However, everything was neatly labeled and packaged, and so after laying it all out on my workbench, I began assembly. There really isn't too much to say here, other than that the booklet was helpful, the instructions clear, and Sinus has produced a video here on YouTube of the entire build process, should you prefer to simply watch and follow along. There were a few tricky steps that would have been a bit easier with a second pair of hands, but I wanted to see if this could be assembled by one person, and I managed to make it work without any major headaches. Since much of this part of the process involves installing things while the unit is upside down, I found that stuffing some bits of styrofoam from the packaging under the sides kept it from rocking back and forth while protecting the knobs and switches. All in all, the entire assembly process for the Ortur Laser Master 3 took me about 45 minutes, and that was with zero previous experience building something like this. So if I'm making this look easy, that's because it was. It's probably also worth mentioning that this laser cutter comes with a hose and attachment to connect to an air compressor to help blow smoke out of the laser's way, which can improve laser cutting efficiency. But I completely skipped this feature, as I felt the laser unit's built-in fan did a great job on its own. Off camera, I also built the Ortur Enclosure 2.0, which is designed to work with the cutter and features a built-in light and fan. After some quick calibrations, I did a test engraving on this piece of basswood and was ready to dive right into the concept stage for the next build. In the past, building structures meant painstakingly cutting by hand into chipboard or styrene, which for an amateur model maker like myself means sticking mostly to simple designs and 90 degree angles. But with the laser cutter, I could now start exploring some really unique geometry. Since I've always loved geodesic domes, I thought it would be cool to make my own. There's a whole online rabbit hole of greenhouse and tiny home builders who've embarked on some of the most wildly ambitious backyard engineering projects I've ever seen, and looking at their designs helped me settle on this truncated cube octahedron, an Archimedean solid with 12 square faces, 8 regular hexagonal faces, and 6 regular octagonal faces. As you can imagine, I'm very popular at parties. To give the lonely dome a little pizzazz, I decided to have a giant gnarled tree erupting from its roof. And to add further intrigue to the scene, I included these tiny pole-mounted roosts. Next came the line work. As always, I'm using water-resistant felt-tip pens for this, and the links for the tools and supplies you see me using can be found in the video description as usual. I'm really glad I started doing these concept paintings, as I found it's really helped me to not only streamline the building process, but also let the ideas marinate. The process of tracing lines and pen frees up my mind to start thinking about building steps, a color palette, the story I want to tell, and how the lore will fit into the rest of my world. 
While tedious at times, I'm enjoying this concept art creation more and more with each build, and it's become a very intimate part of my creative process. Having had time to consider possible color choices during the line work step, I added the watercolors. A sandy ochre for the rocks with some reddish shading, colorful alien fauna, familiar tree colors, and finally some teal and blue for the structure to contrast with the yellows and oranges of the terrain. Lastly, these decorative flags gave me a way to tie the color palette together. To create the design for the truncated cube octahedron, I went into Adobe Animate, made a regular octagon, then began drawing in angled lines to give it a sort of tribal geometric pattern. So often with digital design though, I go overboard with detail and forget the minuscule scale I'm actually working at, and it happened again here. So I had to come back later and simplify everything so that these fine details would actually show up in the engraving. I then brought the exported SVG file into Lightburn, a piece of software used to interact with the laser cutter. The great thing about this software is that I could tell it which lines I wanted to cut the material with and which I simply wanted to engrave with. Then, after donning some UV safety goggles, I fired up the Ortur LaserMaster 3 and began experimenting with movement speed, laser intensity, and the number of passes it made to get just the right effect I wanted. One of my first successful attempts with the cutter was this handy little airbrush stand which was designed by a patron of mine, Illustrated Lefty. After some experimentation, I found just the right settings for the dome's faces. Satisfied, I designed the square sides using the same method, and then the hexagons. It was around this time that I realized that, actually, the octagon's lower halves would be covered by the wooden deck, so I modified the design and recut. I also decided at this point to purchase a laser cutting plate, as I discovered the laser had cut all the way through to the enclosure material, and I was tempting fate here. During a recent trip to a local plastic manufacturer, I stumbled upon this scrap of thin plastic in a dusty corner of the shop. The owner was kind enough to give it to me free of charge. If you're getting into model making, I highly recommend looking for similar local plastic shops and lumber suppliers, as their prices will always be significantly lower than hobby and craft retailers. If I didn't have this material though, I think the tops of those cheap sushi takeout containers would have been a fine substitute. Attaching the dome faces to one another was a much trickier step, but I settled on UV resin for its strong and quick curing nature. Longtime viewers of this channel may remember KP1301, the Automeca tasked with a very special delivery. This build was one of my favorites, and so I'm thrilled to announce the newest addition to my shop, this super comfy screen printed t-shirt featuring an assembly diagram for KP1301's head. I've also added some high quality vinyl stickers to the shop, so check out gamebuilds.com while everything is still in stock. Because I don't have a wire cutting table, it can be a real challenge getting perpendicular cuts for my foam bases. So I thought I'd try this step on the new laser cutter. This was especially useful since I wanted an octagonal base, a complicated shape to cut by hand. While the laser was perfectly capable of this job, you can see that I probably could have used a stronger laser setting or a slower speed so that I could have avoided having to do so many passes and getting this weird unintentional layered effect. Next, after tracing out the footprint of the dome, I began making tiny bricks out of this cheap quarter inch foam. I probably could have gotten away with just doing a brick facade, especially since you can't really see any of this in the end result, but sometimes you just feel like laying bricks. To texture the bricks, I threw them in this plastic tub with random toys and wood cubes and made salsa music. To glue it all down, I used tacky glue, which is just a thicker, drier form of white glue. 
I then added the brick foundation layer by layer, cutting the bricks as needed for the corners. With the brick foundation laid, I transferred the outline to the piece of foam and cut out the insert, which would be used to mount the tree. I next sculpted some pointy rock formations from the remaining foam. The key here is a mixture of slicing, scraping, and chipping to give it the proper texture and shape. For the wooden supports, I used these bamboo skewers purchased from my local Daiso. Once trimmed down with my miter saw, I glued them perpendicular to each side of the brick foundation. It was finally time to give the ground some texture and topography to help blend everything together. For that, I mixed water and plaster of Paris. I smoothed things out by hand, and once that was dry, I applied some tiny plaster chips for rocks and some sand for pebbles. Although I'm still such a novice when it comes to sculpting, I really enjoy working with clay, so I was excited to get started on the tree. I began with the foam insert I'd cut out earlier, tracing the general shape of the roots before making a sculpture armature from aluminum foil. Aluminum armature wire helped to further strengthen the form while also affording me a surface for future branches. Thinner copper wire made for some smaller branches and twigs and once that was finished, I applied the clay skin. To make life a little easier with this sculpt, I purchased a clay roller. Because my clay just sits in tubs between projects, it gets very brittle and tough and can be a pain to start working with. This tool makes things a lot easier by softening the polymer clay while also producing sheets of even thickness, which made the process of applying the tree bark a breeze. With the base layer of bark applied, I added more strips and balls of clay here and there to give me a thicker surface to sculpt later, as I wanted a tree with deep grooves and plenty of character. I then began sculpting, using ball styluses and a stippling motion for the bark's edges. Long, wavy slicing motions with this clay knife made for some convincing grooved wood grain. And once satisfied with the results, I threw it in the oven to bake. Once baked, I created a smooth transition into the foam base using air dry clay. For the tiny birdhouses, I fired up the old laptop and got to modeling some inverted pyramids. Once the overall shape was correct, I used a boolean modifier to cut holes into the sides and hollow out the interiors. Once printed, cured, and sanded, I superglued them to some toothpicks and set them aside for painting. For the flags, I used these alcohol-based markers on a sheet of plain old printer paper. Alcohol markers are great when you want the color to soak through the paper and into the edges, making for a pretty convincing miniature fabric look. The laser cutter once again came in super handy for quickly making this tiny wood rectangle, which I used as a template for mass producing a bunch of colorful foldable flags. A dab of white glue kept the two sides together, and a tiny length of thread made for a perfect rope. The last stage of building was the deck. By the way, I used 2mm basswood sheets for all these wood pieces, and after careful measuring and designing, I was pretty thrilled with this satisfyingly snug fit. However, the wood looked a little too pristine, so to weather it, I carved in some wood grain with an X-Acto blade. This kind of preparatory work goes a long way if you end up staining the wood with an oil wash, 
as these nicks and grooves will soak in the pigment, giving the surface a lot of dimension and visual interest. Next, for the wooden posts under the deck, I use these same bamboo skewers from earlier. Once cut, I snug them into place, set the deck in to make sure the posts were properly positioned, then lock them all into place with superglue. Next came the wooden stairway, also courtesy of the laser cutter. And finally, I made a robotic arm used for tree pruning and limb removal out of some wire, beads, and a tiny action figure part. With the building done, it's on to painting and assembly, and the original short story. The visitor in the long cloak paused at the foot of the dusty steps, studying the odd sight before him. Birds flitted in and out of triangular roosts, painted in the same bright colors that adorn the structure. From within the structure, a large alet tree twisted upward, beckoning the sky with a claw of gnarled bark. The tree was lush and healthy, gracing the area beneath it with a deliciously cool shade. The visitor's skin drank it in as he made his way up the steps. An old man, hunched over with the weight of untold years, emerged from the doorway. He grinned. Ah, a customer. I am delighted. Please come, come, name your ailment. The visitor kept silent as he tilted his head to one side, narrowed eyes scrutinizing the withered figure before him. The old man rubbed his hands together before finally gesturing towards one of the woven sitting mats on the deck. Never mind, never mind. We will have time for such topics. For now, you are my guest, and you will be treated no less. The old man shuffled away now and returned moments later with an octagonal tin brimming with spiced nuts, dried meats, wheat candies, and sugared rose petals. He set it down before the visitor on a tiny wooden tray before pulling a skin jug from his hip and filling a small metal cup for his guest. If you're wondering, I have been graced with generous customers the old man said, nodding at the delicacies. I am told those came from a royal cruiser. To speak frankly, the flavors are almost too foreign for my simple palate. Uh, perhaps you will find them more agreeable. If I may ask, sir, where do you call home? The visitor sniffed the cool drink in his cup before drawing a steady sip. But he did not reply instead staring intently at the branches above him. Moments passed as a drifting breeze sifted desert sand beneath the wooden deck. She's beautiful, isn't she? said the old man. One of the last of her kind. Almost three thousand years old. Long before any of us were here, even the first Royal Scout ships, she was standing tall. It is my hope that she will remain long after we are gone, once the blight finishes its work. The old man's voice trailed off, his mind wandering to other times and places. Other trees can't grow to this size in this environment, but the alet tree succeeds by sending its roots straight down, down to the water table. It drinks up the waters for almost a century before it sprouts from the ground, and nothing more than an ugly brown weed thing at first. I often wonder how many children have torn one from the ground not knowing the power it would one day contain. The ability to heal, 
the ability to restore scar tissue to supple feeling flesh, the ability to rejuvenate bones, cells, organs, a million uses in the bark and leaves of a single plant. Of course, to unlock all its potential, one must have the knowledge of the concoctions, and I'm afraid the previous mender wasn't much of a record keeper. Still, in the eight years I've been here, I've managed to see my share of miracles. If only it could heal our invisible wounds. The old man paused, studying his guest's expression with gentle eyes, before finally dropping his gaze to his hands, as knobby and grooved as the tree beside them. Of course, that's not why you're really here, is it? No, no. I suspect the glint I spied under your cloak isn't payment for a cure at all. I suspect my past has finally caught up with me. You are from the Citadel, aren't you? Well, you should know I'm working to mend my own mistakes. It may take the rest of my days on this planet, but I have vowed to find a cure, to undo the harm I've caused your people, our people. If you must do this, you must. I will not resist your judgment. Perhaps it is time for this old weed to be plucked and destroyed. The visitor straightened his back, cleared his throat, and leaned forward, eyes gray, gaze piercing. I'm not here to kill you, Hargad. I am here to offer you a job. The Citadel will soon be at war, and we need your expertise. Thank you all so much for watching. It's been exciting watching my tiny little channel gain so much traction lately, and as requested by many of you, I am working on the first novels set in this world. Have an awesome day, and until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.